Uh, tonight, it is now my wonderful honor and privilege to introduce to you our speaker. Uh, Dr. Matthew Rojansky is director of the Kennan Institute, which is a part of the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars uh, in the Baltimore region. Uh, and that institute, by the way, is named after uh, the elder George Cannon, who was an explorer uh, of both Russia and Siberia in the later 19th century. Founded in 1972 for the purpose of expanding our knowledge of American uh, policies in Russia and uh, Siberia, Ukraine, that part of the world, and our understanding of that culture and that political body. Uh, we could not be happier to have such a, a timely uh, topic tonight and an expert in U.S. relations with Russia and Ukraine to address that topic. Dr. Rojansky is known around the country, internationally as well, uh, to address these topics uh, for us. In light of these last two weeks, folks, Tonight's topic of the Ukraine and Russia in crisis uh, and its consequences could not be more germane. Uh, we're so thrilled to have him here. At about 10 till 7, our series coordinator, Madonna Kramer, will come to lead us in a Q&A uh, discussion time uh, until about a quarter past 7 or so. So if you have questions, you can certainly ask them at that time. Please help me welcome to our podium tonight, Dr. Matthew Rojansky. Matthew, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Gary. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I hope that was your best decision of the evening, your great decision. Um, and thank you, Gary, and, uh, and Madonna, and Dixie, and, and to the council for making this, this visit possible. Um, I, was, I was particularly pleased to be reminded of something that I knew, uh, which is that uh, Western Michigan was uh, home of Ambassador John Byerly, uh, who was uh, two ambassadors ago, our US ambassador to Russia, uh, did a fantastic job and managed to get out of Dodge just before everything turned south. So uh, hopefully all of you have a similarly good sense of timing, and that'll be your second great decision to leave here at 7.15. I'll try and keep on that schedule. Um, so I'm here to talk to you tonight about uh, some of the causes, but perhaps more importantly, the consequences of what's been going on in Ukraine. Um, most of the basic facts won't come as a surprise to anybody who's been paying attention. But it's important to me that we start from the origins of this crisis. Um, on many levels, that could go back hundreds of years, even a 1,000 years. Uh, but I like to start spring two years ago because I was in Kiev. I was living in Ukraine with my family, uh, doing research on a US government fellowship, working for the embassy uh, on problems related to corruption in Ukraine. And, uh, and funny that I was working on corruption because uh, the whole country was hopping mad about corruption which is why I like to start from this photo that I took when we were out for a walk with our daughter and her stroller and some friends. Um, and there was a peaceful protest of almost 30,000 people in May of 2013 on the streets of Kiev. Now, mind you, that was more than half a year before the events that we now know as the Euromaidan began. And it was completely peaceful, but there was a strong sense of outrage on the streets of Ukraine. What was that about? Why were people so angry? Um, to understand that, you have to understand what the leadership of Ukraine had been like for the past several years, indeed for the past quarter century, but most acutely under President Yanukovych, who was elected freely and fairly, I might add, in 2010, and then proceeded to build a state entirely on the basis of theft, graft, and corruption. Uh, this, for example, is the view from a park called Marinsky Park in the very center on a hilltop, center of Kiev. It's a beautiful city, by the way, built like so many others claim to be on seven hills, just like Rome. It's a view of the Dnieper River. And, of course, in the very middle of it is this hideous uh, glass and steel construct, which is actually a dual helipad and conference center uh, built by President Yanukovych on public land on the theory that he could fly from here to his palatial estate, which was only about 30 minutes north of the city. Of course, he never did because he was afraid that if he got into a helicopter, someone would shoot him down. He nonetheless spoiled the view uh, and spent millions of dollars of taxpayer money to build that monstrosity. He then erected this structure, uh, on 400 acres of public parkland, uh, which he simply took. Um, it looks a little bit rustic, but you all here in Western Michigan will understand that just because it's logs on the outside doesn't mean it doesn't look like that on the inside. Um, you know, his aesthetic is a bit over the top, but you can imagine that tens of millions of dollars that went into constructing and outfitting this estate, um, you know, all on a salary that was less than $100,000 officially on paper. Um, 
he had two bowling alleys in the house, uh, his own private boxing ring, couple of billiard rooms, and of course, as you do, a floating pirate ship themed restaurant, <laughs> which I was told <laughs> cost one billion dollars to acquire the ship and then outfit it. I don't have a photo of the inside, but it was pretty over the top. His personal private chapel, all done in, uh, in gold uh, and uh, mother of pearl and amber inlay. Uh, and then, you know, as you do, a, a stuffed lion guarding his girlfriend's private massage parlor and nail salon, also in a wing of the house. Uh, then his exotic collectible items, uh, old military vehicles, both Soviet and allied. Uh, then his uh, classic civilian car collection that went about three stories of that building. Uh, and then, of course, his exotic animals, uh, most of which are not particularly comfortable in Ukraine in the winter, so you can imagine that the care and feeding of these animals substantially exceeded the care and feeding of pensioners, uh, elderly people, and children in Ukraine at the same time. So people were hopping mad. Are you getting this sense, right? This guy's deeply corrupt. He's stealing everything he can get his hands on. Um, in, in less glamorous ways as well, the corruption became evident when Ukraine hosted the uh, European soccer championships in 2012. I was lucky enough to get to go to some of the great um, soccer matches in Kiev, uh, but they co-hosted it with Poland, and this was an interesting chance to compare the kind of uh, numbers, the, the, the bureaucracy of corruption, if you will. Uh, the Ukrainians spent roughly twice as much uh, per seat in this soccer, uh, set of soccer uh, matches as the Poles did, and the result was um, much, much worse from an infrastructure standpoint, though not terrible. Uh, Yanukovych himself was a celebrated author. I'm kidding. No one had ever heard of these books that he published. He published a couple of books, uh, mostly so that he could receive royalties from those books, uh, which was cover for graft payments that he was receiving from uh, various uh, companies and oligarchs who wanted to pay him money. Uh, Ukrainians have never heard of these books. So why did they pour out into the street? Very simple answer. They were sick of the corruption. And in November of 2013, they got their excuse, which was that Towards the end of that month, Yanukovych was due to sign an agreement with the European Union called an association agreement. It didn't really promise very much, but it was deeply symbolic. It was symbolic of a light at the end of a tunnel, a point at which Ukrainians could emerge from the post-Soviet twilight uh, and become Europeans and live, in their view, decently. Live decently the way that Germans did or Poles did uh, or other former communist states did, like people in the, in the Baltic region. And when Yanukovych announced uh, it, late in November of 2013, that he wouldn't sign the agreement, that instead uh, he was going to accept a, a bailout offer from the Russian government and that he would pursue talks uh, an association uh, with Russia in the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, people were simply fed, out, fed up. They poured out into the streets, and at that point their main demand was simply, Yanukovych, keep your promise. Sign the agreement. Um, their demands were not fundamentally political. In fact, at that time, uh, the people taking part in the protests in Kiev denied political parties the right to participate with their party flags and slogans and their leaders uh, taking advantage of the moment to give big puffery kinds of political speeches. Um, and in fact, the protests most likely would have ended at that. It would have been a few days of public outrage, uh, but ultimately settling into the despair of acceptance that Ukrainian leaders always break their promises. But then he did something else stupid. Someone in the Ukrainian government ordered that protesters who were encamped outside of government buildings be attacked on the night of November 30th. Uh, no one was killed, but young people were beaten up. And the image of Ukrainian police officers beating up people's children was something that stuck with ordinary Ukrainians and transformed the nature of the Maidan protest. Maidan, by the way, just means square in the Ukrainian language, so people occupying a square is the translation. Um, people went to Facebook. They began posting information about resources, where you could find resources to help you make it through the cold winter days if you wanted to come out to the Maidan and protest. Uh, people turned to Twitter and other social networking tools to teach each other about uh, why they ought to be outraged and to coordinate when to turn up in the streets. In fact, you see an interesting correlation here between uh, the critical moments in the protest movement. Uh, I pointed out the evening of, December, of uh, November 30th when the young people were beaten up on into the winter. Uh, later on, I'll talk about mid-January, the passage of the so-called dictatorship laws. You see that Twitter accounts are created en masse so that Ukrainians can coordinate using social networks. Uh, of course, technology is a two-way street. Um, if you were out in the streets in the middle of January of last year, you might have received this message on your iPhone, which uh, roughly translated says, uh, Dear subscriber, you have been registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. Imagine 
how that feels. They know who you are, they have you on a list, and watch out. Bear in mind, at this point, nobody knew that Yanukovych was going to go, that the revolution was going to succeed, and that perhaps in the end that they would be safe. And so that was a real step of intimidation. But nonetheless, the people came out, and they came out by the hundreds of thousands. Um, on into December and January, the streets were intermittently occupied, uh, but the protests remained largely peaceful. Uh, opposition political parties were involved, but at a relatively low level. And mostly the demand was, Yanukovych signed the agreement to associate with the European Union, give us a light at the end of the tunnel, and punish those responsible for beating up our children. So what changed? In the middle of January, to try to, dispel, uh, to, try to uh, uh, dissolve the protest movement, Yanukovych prodded the parliament to pass a series of what's now known as dictatorship laws. And I basically think of this as the anti-Bill of Rights. You're basically not allowed to do anything. You can't speak your mind. You can't make fun of the government, certainly. But you can't even gather in large groups in public. Uh, you can't gather, you can't drive in a coordinated group of vehicles because one of the tactics used by the protesters was to uh, follow officials to their palatial homes and then kind of parade cars around and block the traffic in front of the houses. In other words, uh, the government was behaving in a truly dictatorial fashion. And this deeply offended the Ukrainian people. Um, at this point in the protests, people begin to talk about Yanukovych needing to go. And this is when the scenes that are now famous from the depths of winter, from January and February in Kiev, uh, began to take place. The clashes on Khrushchevskova Street, where you had barricades erected, just as in the French Revolution, tires set on fire. And then this one I like in particular. This is a bus that had been used to bring uh, the famous Berkut riot police uh, down to the Maidan, to the square, to combat the protesters. It had been set on fire and then spray-painted garbage truck on the front. So you start to get a sense of the radicalization and the politicization of the protests. This is a real change in character from the way things had been in November and December. This is the state of the city uh, by mid-February of 2014. You can see the orange areas here, mostly uh, lower-lying areas. This street, the main thoroughfare, Khrushchev, it's a real a uh, beautiful street. I remember walking there with ice cream with my family uh, in the evenings. Uh, oddly enough, Ukrainians were still doing that during the protests. That, that always amazed me, both the eating ice cream in the depths of winter and the promenading during the, the, the protests. I have a great photo. It's not in here. It's of a woman with a Prada bag uh, in the midst of these encampments with, with, with flames in the background. But uh, this is the surreal nature of life in Kiev. And in fact, uh, this area up here, Government Hill, where the presidential uh, uh, palace was, the, um, uh, the cabinet of ministers, uh, and the parliament building. Uh, this was still occupied by government forces. And the rest of the city pretty much went on life as usual. Um, but then something very dramatic changed. And that was towards the end of February last year when someone gave an order. And it's really still disputed to this day. Uh, there are different theories. Was it Yanukovych? Was it someone else senior in the government? Uh, was it the Russians? Was this a provocation uh, by the opposition themselves, by the West? Uh, but someone gave the order for uh, elite forces to start using uh, sniper rifles uh, and shooting at civilians. Um, and in fact, this resulted in dozens, even over 100 casualties, uh, and a radicalization of the protest that turned into an outright revolution. So this is the moment at which, in late February of last year, the protests go from being angry and political and demanding that Yanukovych go to recognizing that they are now all in. There is no exit strategy for these protesters. If they don't succeed, they have to give their lives, and this truly becomes a revolution. Now, there's one moment, kind of a last-minute dither, where some European diplomats come in and negotiate what seems to be a face-saving agreement that gets Yanukovych to stay on for a few more weeks or months promises, though, to hold an early election. The opposition parties uh, here represented by Vitaly Klitschko, the, the boxer. You probably heard a lot about him. Uh, he's now mayor of Kiev. Uh, they accepted this agreement. Um, and it seemed that there was actually a, a, a sort of um, a cooling uh, to the whole protest movement, and that, in fact, maybe we had reached a compromise. Well, that was not to be. Uh, as the security cameras in his own palace captured, Yanukovych returns home that evening uh, stuffs a couple of, uh, of freight trucks full of all of the goodies that he can steal from this palace that he built with the people's money, and he disappears from the scene. He simply escapes Ukraine and ceases effectively to be president. At that point, the Russians respond in a way that they hadn't until then. 
This is when the so-called little green men are uh, deployed all across Crimea. Crimea being a peninsula that hangs down into the Black Sea from the Ukrainian mainland. It's very easy to cut off. You can see it choke points here and here. Um, and Russian troops had been there to begin with, in particular at their base in Sevastopol, which was the headquarters of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, and then the post-Soviet Russian Black Sea Fleet. So they had tens of thousands of soldiers there, relatively easy for those soldiers to fan out across Crimea. Why Crimea, by the way? You may have heard this. Um, Crimea was heavily ethnic Russian, heavily Russian-speaking, and of course, famously, was given by Khrushchev for no particular reason, though in fact there were a lot of reasons we can talk about, to Ukraine from Russia during Soviet times, right? A gift that doesn't really mean a whole lot since they were at that time part of the same empire. These are the little green men, little green men in the sense that they're wearing Russian uniforms, they're speaking Russian, they're following Russian tactics, they sound like Russians, they quack like Russians, but um, they weren't wearing the Russian flag on their shoulders and they refused to acknowledge themselves as Russian troops. Now what comes next after this Russian occupation of Crimea and ultimately an annexation of Crimea, uh, and we'll talk about the motives for that a bit later, uh, is a kind of growing uh, attempted move to repeat this process in southeastern Ukraine. Now, you can see from this map the rough distribution of uh, Russian speakers, ethnic Russians. Um, it's a little bit murky, but the basic idea is that the farther east and south you go within Ukraine, the more people who would identify closely with Russia. Um, obviously, there are many, many Ukrainians who would say, I'm an ethnic Ukrainian, I'm a Ukrainian citizen, but who nonetheless speak the Russian language every day. Kiev, until about 10 years ago, was a relatively heavily Russian-speaking city. So things are complicated. But the idea is that these border regions of Russia, uh, and in particular, uh, a mining region that's known as the Donbass, it's sort of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, or regions of Ukraine, um, were most kind of amenable to the Russian line and for that reason, the Russians assumed that these, reasons that these regions would rise up spontaneously, uh, seeing what had happened, that the legitimate government had been deposed, that Viktor Yanukovych, who was a Russian speaker, who was from Donetsk himself, uh, had been removed, that these folks would rise up and they would essentially repeat the Crimea scenario, uh, perhaps ending in annexation, perhaps ending in independence. So by the early spring of 2014, the Russians sponsor a series of so-called referenda in this part of Ukraine, um, and there are de declarations of independence in Donetsk. Although uh, a great many of excuse me, although a great many of the leaders there, when interviewed, say very explicitly, "We're not interested in independence. We want to be a part of the Russian Empire." So it's understood that this is actually about union with Russia. Um, now that aspect of the conflict, though potentially very troubling for European security is not getting a whole lot of attention until this moment in July of last summer. And that's when the unfortunate, once again, Malaysian airliner flying over Ukraine. Why flying over Ukraine, by the way? Because Ukraine is enormous. People tend not to realize Ukraine is actually the largest country in Europe other than Russia, and it is sort of in the middle of a whole lot of flight paths. But while most airlines were uh, assiduously avoiding the conflict region, unfortunately this Malaysian airliner didn't, um, and it was shot down by uh, a missile that the one thing we know for sure is that it was definitely fired from separatist-held territory in Russia. Exactly how it was uh, gotten a hold of, where it was supplied, etc., we don't know for sure. But this tragic crash elevates the level of international attention, and in particular European attention, with the recognition that, you know what, this is a conflict in our backyard. And in particular, when you look at the number of victims on that crash, who are from the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, etc., uh, suddenly Europe begins a little bit more to take this conflict seriously. Now, what, in fact, is the conflict? And here I like to show these photos because it illustrates um, really who's doing the majority of the fighting. This is not the kind of war that we imagined from the Cold War, you know, massive tank battles across the plains of Europe, right? This is largely siege warfare uh, and, and irregular guerrilla warfare between irregular forces. So on one side, you have the, the so-called separatist volunteers, who are either local folks, local mafiosi in some cases, quote-unquote volunteers coming from other parts of the former Soviet Union, largely Russia, but also Central Asia, the Caucasus, etc. And they're fighting with the pro-Russian separatists. And they look like this. And then you have the pro-Ukrainian volunteers. And they look like this. So in other words, it's kind of hard to tell the difference, right? 
This is not a normal war, where you have normal armies on both sides. And one of the problems with that, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is chain of command. It's very hard to make determinations about what's likely to happen if we do X, when we don't actually know who's going to decide to do Y. So unfortunately, the tactics being used by both sides result in really large numbers of civilian casualties given the nature of this conflict. For example, firing from civilian buildings, very common, even occupied civilian buildings, um, and using these classic Soviet-type uh, missile artillery systems. And I say missile artillery because they're basically not aimed, right? This is just like a, a barrage in a general direction of high explosive filled rockets. Um, and they're absolutely devastating, and they have this kind of result on civilian infrastructure. So the Donbass region of Ukraine, which before the conflict had actually been heavily built up, heavily industrialized, one of the wealthiest parts of the country, and the country's biggest source of tax revenue, has now been largely obliterated, and industry has ground to a halt. By any measure, uh, it has been a tragedy for Ukraine. The Donetsk airport, uh, built during that same European soccer championship that I mentioned in 2012 at a cost of a billion dollars. And by the way, you can see from this modern glass and steel structure, um, inside the airport you would have found things like a Porsche KN Turbo SUV with a little sign, you can win this if you buy something at the duty-free store, and you know, all kinds of great restaurants. And this is a really modern airport, right? So imagine you know, going through better than JFK, right? Like, you know, this is not a, a trashy American airport from the 1970s that's been, you know, refurbished. Brand new, beautiful airport. That's how it looks today, right? It has been completely destroyed. So not only is it a billion dollars of value for Ukraine, but it's symbolic of the fact that this region of the country, which is a heavily populated region, has now been cut off from the wider world, right? These people are truly held hostage to the conflict going on. And, and let's not forget, um, this is the heart of Europe people, right? This is not 10,000 miles away. This is an hour and a half flight away from Berlin, right? This is a two-hour flight away from Paris, right? This is the center of Europe. And then, of course, uh, the messages we continue to get through the media. Uh, the conflict's getting worse. There are more and more uh, Russian uh, troops, equipment, etc., uh, pouring into the region. Of course, uh, the Ukrainian side is also pouring in more, and there's a proposal floating out there for the West to do its part. So what is this all about? What is, what is Putin looking for in this conflict? What does he want? I would suggest that Vladimir Putin has basically three objectives. Uh, but I wouldn't start with the one that we hear most about, which is geopolitics, right? The, the Russia versus the West. Um, in fact, Putin starts with domestic politics. And for one very simple reason, and that's survival. What has happened in Ukraine looks suspiciously similar to something that could happen in Russia. That is, a duly elected but authoritarian-leaning post-Soviet corrupt leader was deposed in popular street protests by people who wanted a better life. Gee, that sounds like something that could happen in Russia. In fact, in 2011 and 2012, more than 100,000 people poured onto the streets in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, and other cities of Russia, demanding awfully similar things. So for Putin, it is vitally important not just to dispel the notion of this in the abstract, that in theory this was a bad thing. No, to ensure that the Ukrainian people come out worse off as a result of having deposed their leader in more chaos and more poverty and more misery and more isolated from the world than they were before. Otherwise, the message to Russians will be, why not us too? And similarly, for Ukrainian oligarchs, for the big business people who basically ran Ukraine, more on them in a moment as well, the message needs to be, revolution is bad for business. And the same message needs to be delivered to Russian oligarchs. So this is about survival of Putin's regime and the Putin system. Secondly, it's about Putin's credibility. His message from the beginning of this revolution in Ukraine has been that this is a plant, that this is a strategy, this is the United States, the CIA, this is Western Europe, backing radical Ukrainian nationalists, fascists even, revanchist Nazis, the people we defeated in the Great Patriotic War, that is World War II, seizing power backed by the West who intend to commit genocide against Russians. That has been the Putin narrative from the beginning, and he has stuck to it. And so his credibility at this point hinges on stories like these. That's Oleg Tyanibok, and in fact, look, there is some evidence for this, right? He's not completely making this up. 
there are radicals, there are extreme nationalists, and there are even fascists or former fascists who are involved in government in Ukraine. So he tells a story like that of Oleg Tanibuk, head of the Freedom Party uh, from Western Ukraine, uh, definitely a, at least a former fascist. Here he is shaking hands with Senator McCain. So the narrative that connects the West, the United States, always scheming, always strategizing to hem Russia in with this old, powerful, historic image of a threat from the West, from fascism, from Russophobia. Putin tells this story extremely effectively, and it's been persuasive for Russians. It's also important that Russia is combating a foreign invader, right? The idea that as with the threat from Georgia in 2008, tiny, tiny little country of Georgia, but that invaded its tiny, tiny separatist region of South Ossetia, Russia was able to come to the defense of the poor South Ossetians, and Putin got a huge popularity boost out of the 2008 Georgia war. Similarly, his popularity, which had been relatively low for Putin, I know American presidents would, would love to have popularity of 60%, but he was at 60% before the Ukraine crisis hit its acute phase, and now he's way above 70 or 80%. In fact, this, this chart's already a little dated. He's up near 90%. So the idea is nationalism sells. You tell this narrative, it makes you popular. And it sells, interestingly enough, even when the economy is tanking. And that's the part of the story that many Americans don't fully appreciate. The president often says, well, our sanctions are working because we've punished Russia, and the ruble is collapsing, and the economy is collapsing. Yeah, but the Putin system has never been stronger. right? Mr. Putin is deeply popular for Russians. And of course, all of this speaks to the image that he has in Russia today, which is that of the Tsar. Right? There is the great father, which is God, and there is the little father, which is the Tsar. And Putin today is the little father of Russia. Now, geopolitics is a part of the story, but I intentionally put it third on the list. That's important to remember. Is Putin trying to rebuild the Soviet Union? I'm often asked. The answer is no. He's not Soviet. He's not socialist. He's not communist. The man is a sheer mercantilist, absolute pragmatist. He is seeking to rebuild a sphere of influence around Russia, something that he believes is Russia's divine right, something that he fully expects to happen, something he believes is, in fact, inevitable. But he makes an interesting argument. There's a positive dimension to the argument, and there's a negative dimension to the argument. The positive dimension goes like this. Russia and the other former Soviet republics lived together for a very long time. They have infrastructure which was designed to work in tandem with one another, that is, supply chains for uh, growing something somewhere and processing it in another place and then manufacturing it in yet a third place. They have a lot of connectivity when it comes to family ties. They have a lingua franca, that is, they all speak Russian. They respect one another's diplomas. Let me tell you, if you come out with a Ukrainian degree and you try to work in Germany or the United States, you're going to have a lot of trouble, not so much in Russia. So Mr. Putin sends the message to the entire post-Soviet world that if you stick with Russia, you'll be a little bit better off. And the idea in the end, at least Putin has said this, is that we will have a better bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, in particular the European Union and the United States, if we stick together. Not an entirely insane message, right? That's the positive side. The negative side is Russia has been surrounded and Russia is under attack. And here he's talking about NATO. And his message when it comes to Ukraine is like Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings movie. I hope the reference isn't lost on everyone. He throws down the gauntlet and says, you shall not pass, right? NATO has expanded and expanded and expanded over the last 25 years. And the Russian message is, Ukraine is a bridge too far. NATO will not be allowed to go to Ukraine. And Putin has said this over and over and over. So what about the Ukrainian side of the story? Well, the Ukrainians are, in fact, surrounded. If the Russians imagine that they're surrounded, the Ukrainians really are surrounded. Uh, not only are there Russian troops now, of course, in Crimea and in Ukraine's southeast and in Russia itself, they're also in Belarus, which is a close Russian military ally, and in the Transnistria region, which is a separatist region of Moldova. So Ukraine really is fully surrounded. Ukraine's military is very weak, and it's weak in ways that are not going to be solved, by the way, by a few weapons. This is the Ukrainian Navy. I took this picture in Odessa shortly after the annexation of Crimea. The annexation of Crimea, I should note, went with the Russian seizure of whatever remained of the Soviet Navy that Ukraine had inherited. So literally, the Ukrainian Navy is whatever was not in port at that moment. 
Um, so they have very few ships, but that's only just symbolic. It's really more on a human level that the Ukrainian military is in big trouble. No matter how brave, no matter how patriotic they are, they have been unable to successfully mobilize the population for a normal draft process. They have been unable to rely on their officer corps. As an example, the chief admiral of the Ukrainian Navy, when given the opportunity, went over to become the deputy head of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in March of last year. So the idea that the Ukrainian military is just like Swiss cheese, full of holes, uncertain loyalties, uncertain competencies, and of course as deeply corrupt as any other part of Ukrainian society, uh, this makes Ukraine weak and this makes Ukraine vulnerable. Of course, we know about the problem of separatism. You know, when your territory is occupied by separatist forces, when there's a war going on up and down this line of control, and when you don't control your own border, that further weakens and neuters Ukraine's ability to govern itself. Moreover, the Ukrainian elections, which were held last October, were in many respects a successful election. But when you hold an election during wartime, you often get very skewed results. And so one of the problems the Ukrainians had in, have in terms of governance now is that the parliament is overwhelmingly dominated by nationalist groups. And the only group that even can purport to represent this population in the southeast of the country, the folks who are enduring the brunt of the violence and the fighting, is the so-called opposition bloc, who are at least partially discredited by their former association with Yanukovych, and who in any case only won 7.5% of the vote. So the idea is the Ukrainian government has its back up against the wall of radical nationalism at the same time that they're facing on the front the threat from Putin. And of course, Putin controls the airwaves in much of the Russian-speaking world. Uh, the Ukrainians for 25 years did not invest in Russian language broadcasting with a Ukrainian perspective. So that means if you are a Russian speaker, wherever your citizenship is, whether it, you live in Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova or any other former Soviet country, if you're a Russian speaker, chances are you listen to television out of Moscow. As we know from our own heavily polarized mass media, that really affects your perspective on the world. And then, of course, there's the energy weapon. Uh, the Russians easily have the ability to cut off gas to Ukraine all throughout the cold winter months when it's badly needed. Now, Ukraine is caught between a rock and a hard place. The hard place is very much of its own making. That's how the Maidan looked shortly after the protests. Then it was cleared. Don't imagine, though, that that's the end of the story. I've been told multiple times by veterans of the Maidan movement, some of whom are now fighting in the southeast, that a third Maidan is just around the corner and that this poses a threat to today's Ukrainian government. That if they give in, or if they're seen to be too pragmatic in their dealings with Putin, the West, or anybody else, that these people are perfectly prepared to return to Kiev and remove by force the very government that they brought into power by force. And then, of course, there's Ukraine's economy. This is a country that is literally on the brink of bankruptcy. I like to say it's about a month away from bankruptcy, but it's a kind of rolling month, right? Because they keep scraping together enough to get by. But what they haven't had yet is an, a big enough bailout, a big enough plan that enables them to overwhelm this crisis and restart the engine of the private economy. But suffice it to say that last year, Ukraine's economy declined by over 10%, and we're probably looking at similar kinds of numbers for this year, while the currency is, uh, has depreciated by nearly 100% as well. And there you can see the decline of Ukraine's foreign currency reserves uh, along with the inflation of its currency. So where is all of this headed? There's the new guy, Petro Poroshenko, president of Ukraine, um, offered a lot of hope and promise in the spring of last year. Actually, he's not so new. He was Yanukovych's minister of the economy. Not looking very happy about that, though he did seem to do very well over the last 10 years or so. He's one of the wealthiest men in Europe uh, and in Ukraine. So to imagine that he is somehow a completely new force in Ukrainian politics is, of course, fantasy. Um, similarly, the oligarchs, the same small group of extremely wealthy Ukrainians who control something like more than 80% of the country's wealth, um, they still run the show. So this guy, Igor Kolomoisky, uh, he is the governor of Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, which is the region right next to where the conflict is taking place. It is also the most populous region of Ukraine. It's one of the wealthiest. Um, he has several private army battalions of his own that are fighting in the Donbass. 
that's very scary if you're the president of Ukraine, that one of your governors has a private army that might not be loyal to you, in fact, almost certainly isn't loyal to you. Um, and then, of course, you have the problem of media space in Ukraine. Every single source of information, at least mainstream source of information in Ukraine, is owned by one of these oligarchs, including the president, by the way, who promised that he would divest himself of all of his holdings, media, his chocolate empire, uh, his real estate, et cetera, before he ran for president. Didn't keep that promise. Sounds an awful lot like the previous leadership of Ukraine. Um, and when he was invited to the United States, given this extremely rare privilege of addressing a joint session of the United States Congress, he used the opportunity to stick the thumb in the eye of Americans uh, by saying, thank you very much for the financial assistance that you've sent and the blankets and so on, but blankets don't win wars. Um, you need to send us weapons. So what, in fact, should we do in Ukraine? Uh, this is the famous Lenin question, or what to do. I would suggest uh, these are two things not to do. Uh, don't send John Kerry uh, to meet with Ukrainian leaders who then say irresponsible things. Uh, and then don't send Toria Newland, our, our Assistant Secretary of State, to hand out cookies on the Maidan uh, when people don't need cookies. By the way, I would note about the Ukrainian Maidan, it was not a revolution of the poor. This was not about bread and salt, right? Uh, this was a, a revolution of relatively middle class, well-off people, educated, sophisticated, so-called creative classes. So this was uh, uh, an incredibly ignorant move uh, to act as if these people were starving. Well, okay, number one, what do we do? We, we get information on the ground. So last May in Odessa, which is a city in Ukraine's southwest, a heavily Russian-speaking city, by the way, um, there was a fire in which about 35 people were killed, and those people happened to be pro-Russian protesters. Now, the way this was depicted in Russian media was literally that this was a repetition of a World War II-style Nazi atrocity. The people were locked in the building, and they were burned to death. Awfully horrible, right? And very good for propaganda purposes if you want to mobilize Russian anger against Ukrainian nationalism. What actually happened was more complicated, but there weren't enough international observers on the ground that we actually had any clue what was going on. What we also lack is eyes on the Russian-Ukrainian border. There's already been an agreement to put OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, observers all up and down the, the Russian-Ukrainian border, but the money and the, uh, and the boots on the ground have not been provided. So at any given point, we only have kind of a, a spotty, sketchy idea about what's crossing over the border, and that's why you keep seeing these reports. So how is it possible that there are hundreds of tanks rolling over the border and no one knows about it, no one's doing anything about it? Well, this is why. So that's recommendation number one. Recommendation number two, think about the impact of sanctions not only in the short term, but in the longer term. One of the challenges we've had is we have made dramatic declarations about what our sanctions are doing. I'm not opposed to sanctions. I think they're a very good idea. But only if we focus on what they can do and not what they can't do. So when the president says, we have proven that big states cannot bully little states, see, we have sanctions, he's wrong. Because the sanctions can do three things. One, they can send a moral message. That I think we've done. Two, they can try to change the conduct of the party being sanctioned, in this case, Putin and Russia. That I don't think we have done. Or three, they could try to so weaken that party that he's brought to his knees and there's a change of government in Russia. And that, too, not only hasn't happened, but almost certainly won't happen, given how popular Putin is. So making these vast declarations about the impact of our policies, when in fact they're not backed up by reality, I think actually undermines our position. Moreover, if you look at how our sanctions are targeted, the, the famous targeted sanctions, I would posit that we have a completely mistaken idea of how Russia works. If we think that we can sanction the top 50 wealthiest people in Russia, and they will simply turn on Putin and bring him down in some kind of palace coup, or that Putin will run away the way that Yanukovych did, I think we don't understand Russia. And this is all I have to show you. This guy, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, was the richest man in Russia until about 10 years ago when Putin put him in prison in Siberia. That was the end of Mikhail Khodorkovsky. This guy, Igor Sechin, is one of Putin's close friends. He is now the wealthiest man in Russia. You get how this works, right? Putin is a tough guy. He has a lot of resources at his disposal, and he makes it very clear on whose side you want to be. This, by the way, is Moscow, just a couple of months ago. Um, I like to say, yes, sanctions do have an impact on wealth, on quality of life, on freedom to travel, all of those things in, in Moscow. But let me just give you an example. Uh, my very good friend, a Russian, was going to get married in Prague in April of this year. 
He can no longer afford to do so because the ruble has collapsed, so he's going to get married in Moscow and spend his money in Moscow instead. But the Mercedes that he bought, and it's not one of these super expensive ones, um, he just bought. It's going to last him five, maybe ten more years. I mean, it's a Mercedes, but it'll still last, I hope. So the idea is the Russian quality of life is not just going to tank overnight, right? Russians aren't going to pour out into the streets because they can't afford to buy bread anymore, because they can't get cabbage or potatoes, right? On the margins, wealthy Russians will be suffering, but none of this is going to foment a revolution. Moreover, there'll be a backlash, and we need to think very hard about whether we want to see this kind of backlash. Uh, this is a screenshot from Russian television talking about how you shouldn't buy any Western agricultural products because they're much less healthy than Russian products. People actually believe this stuff. Um, these are t-shirts for sale on the street in Moscow. People actually wear these things. Putin is great, Putin wearing sunglasses, Putin's going to beat up Obama, that sort of thing. <laughs> and then there's the China factor. Listen, our economic relationship with the Chinese is, is far and away larger and more important to China than is Russia's. But the Chinese don't have to make a choice, and so they won't. What they're doing is, on the margins, as they see sanctions applied to Russia, a country that is larger than every other country the United States has ever sanctioned put together, they're just marginally shifting resources away from places where they're dependent on the United States and Western Europe. So when they do transactions with the Russians, instead of clearing them in dollars or in euros, they're clearing them in yuan or in rubles. These little infinitesimal shifts in the global economy are going to have long-term consequences because our prosperity in the United States has for a very long time been premised on the idea that we are the clearinghouse for global trade and finance and commerce and law and insurance and all of these common goods that the rest of the world has subscribed to. Well, the Russia-China axis is beginning to chip away at that. And then, of course, energy. No matter what we do, no matter what happens to the price of oil, whether we are behind it or not, whether the Saudis are behind it or not, Russia is an energy superpower. Someone will always need to consume that oil, and the Russians will be able to sell that oil. And in the meantime, they have a lot of money that they can spend down to try to support uh, domestic subsidies while they're suffering from a low oil price. So in the longest of long term, how can Ukraine succeed? I think the message here is very, very difficult. It's sort of deceptively simple. And that is, Ukraine needs to combat corruption. Ukraine has failed as compared to other post-communist countries. And here we see Poland in the dark line and Ukraine in the light-colored line. So you note, in relative terms, Ukrainians are actually poorer today than they were in Soviet times, right? A very sad statement. And that's largely been because of corruption. Ukraine is ranked as the most corrupt country in the entire post-Soviet space. That is an extremely high bar, a very impressive accomplishment. <laughs> so in order to solve this problem, Ukrainians need to take seriously the idea that they need to do painful things in the short term in order to achieve success in the long term. And then my last recommendation would be to focus on what we in the United States can actually do, and that's open the doors, right? We have an extremely restrictive policy for travel to and from this region. If Ukrainians don't know what they're missing in the United States or in Europe, then they won't understand why they should make the difficult sacrifices that are needed to change their own society. So we need to bring Ukrainians here as much as possible on exchange programs, educational visas, professional visas, etc. And we need to send Americans there. And it might help if we knew something more broadly about this part of the world. Unfortunately, I have to tell you tonight that the main federal government-sponsored programs that for the entire Cold War and for the last 25 years have supported to the tune of a few million dollars, right? We're talking about money that falls off the back of the truck at the Pentagon every day, that supported scholarship and study uh, and visits to this region, including my own work. I mean, it's the reason I'm an expert on this region today, that these programs have either been slashed or entirely eliminated. So I like to close with a line from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the famous Soviet dissident. He wrote a letter to a Ukrainian colleague in Canada in 1981, and in it he said something prescient. The Ukrainian question is one of the most dangerous questions facing us in the future. On both sides, we are mentally poorly prepared to face it. I would like to bring reconciliation to heal this dangerous split. But just as it's useless to prove to Ukrainians that we all hail by blood and in spirit from Kiev, 
so too Russians do not want to appreciate that those living along the Dnieper are a different people, and that many injuries and grievances were sown by the Bolsheviks. It will be very difficult to guide this conversation to a sensible haven, but whatever voice and weight I have, I shall apply it to this end. In any case, I know one thing. Should there arise, God forbid, a Russo-Ukrainian war, I won't join it myself, and I won't let my sons go. And I think it's that kind of restraint and wisdom, and above all, patience, that I would caution. There are no easy answers, but we need to take this conflict seriously. Thank you. We'd like to start our Q&A portion of it. We have two opportunities. One is to come down to the mic over here, over there, or over here. Or you can text a question, um, and Mark is going to be putting up the number. You can text it to um, the phone number that you'll see up there, and we can read the questions for you. So you can stay anonymous if that's how you like, or if you're in the middle of the row and you don't want to interrupt. You are never anonymous. <laughs> um, but I will start uh, with one question for you. Yeah. Um, we have had foreign speakers uh, that are from other regions of the world, and we had one particular in the last year, and I picked his brain and asked him about Putin. And I said, tell me what you think. And he said, well, I don't like to come to the United States and tell you stuff you don't like to hear. So I asked him you know, to elaborate. And you know, in America, we think of Putin as this, um, you call him a pragmatist, but we often think of him as a power-hungry bully. Right. He described him and said that in Europe, he is known as a statesman mm. and that he's somebody that has a vision. Can you comment on that, of what other, how p other governments that we are allies with, how they view him in this context? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, so first of all, I would just note um, the, the problem with any kind of moral analysis of Putin is that that doesn't matter. Um, in the Russian context, nobody's looking for their leader to be moral. Putin is neither moral nor immoral. He's basically amoral, right? Um, moral considerations were nowhere on the list of why he cares about Ukraine. Um, from that standpoint, the question that matters is, has he been effective? And so when Russians ask, has Putin been effective, they look at when he came to power versus today. And yeah, Russia's got problems today. There's no doubt about that. A lot of them in the Russian narrative can be attributed to us, to the United States, right? Um, we, we never understood Russia. We never treated them right uh, from the Cold War until now, right? This is the story. Um, and once again, we're trying to undermine them and make their lives harder. Uh, but even so, just, just on the merits, Russians are wealthier than they were when Putin came to power. Uh, Russians are safer than they were. Remember, there was a raging war in Chechnya in the North Caucasus. Uh, Russians were suffering terrorist attacks on a frequent basis uh, in cities in the heart of Russia. Um, and Russians are prouder than they were when Putin came to power. They have a sense that they matter. Look, no matter what else you think about what he's done, Russia's in the news. Russia is a global player, and it's on the world stage. So this is kind of as things are seen from Moscow. You know, opinion elsewhere in the world, like let's take Europe, for example, uh, has shifted dramatically. I think if you went three, four years ago, I think they would have said, you know, Putin's an elder statesman, right? He's been around longer than any of these other European leaders, and, you know, he's basically been doing okay. Again, the Russian economy is growing, uh, you know, uh, Russia has a much bigger profile than it ever did, um, and he's a pretty effective negotiator, right? But he very seldom ends up with the short end of the stick in negotiations with any partner. Um, so I think there was a certain grudging respect for Putin in Europe. That has changed. The Ukraine crisis, the perception that Putin is brutal, and this kind of coming to grips with his real amorality, right? The sort of the dead-eyed KGB phenomenon uh, that, you know, John McCain talked endlessly about, um, you know, whether John McCain was right about that or not, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, has come around to the notion that she really doesn't like Putin. Rather than kind of grudging mutual respect, uh, there's now deep personal antipathy between these two important leaders. Similarly, Barack Obama getting along reasonably well with Medvedev, who was P Putin's kind of hand-picked successor slash regent, um, and then the Obama-Putin dynamic is, is, is utter poison, right? Like the two of them really cannot deal with each other, and you see that on a human level. So. Uh, I think, you know, where you sit is where you stand. If you're, if you're the leader of China, Xi Jinping, you know, you get along pretty well with Putin because you have an awful lot to gain from Russia's relative isolation from the West. You get a good price on natural resources. You get this vast Siberian territory into which your companies and construction crews and settlers can expand. And, 
So, you know, Russia is a pretty good deal for China right now, and for that reason, Putin's very popular. So it really depends on whose perspective. But, but our sense in the United States that this is like somehow the second coming of Hitler, right, is not widely shared internationally. That's, that is an important thing to understand. I, th you know, I really appreciate your analysis. I mean, I, th I think you, you really have a handle on what's going on, and it certainly taught me a thing or two. But what I come, my takeaway is that I'm rather demoralized by what you, you've uh, told us today, and I really kind of, it looks kind of hopeless on the part of Ukraine. I mean, I, it looks to me like they're going to lose, that uh, Ukraine's going to continue to be dismembered. And it leaves me wondering whether we, the United States, should be backing a loser. Maybe we should, uh, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And if y Ukraine's going to be divided anyway, and we're only hurting ourselves by alienating Russia, why are we, uh, why are we championing this in Ukraine? Uh, boy, that's pretty cynical. Um, <laughs> are you sure you're not from Washington? <laughs> uh, okay, look, you're right, uh, or at least I, I believe, based on, on my analysis, um, and, and what others who know the military situation well tell me, Ukraine is going to lose. It's going to lose the military aspect of the conflict. Why is that important to understand? It's important to understand because the people paying the costs for this conflict are Ukrainians, period, full stop, right? Um, when the separatists fight the Ukrainian volunteer forces, who's dying? Ukrainians on both sides, right? The Russians are not sending tens of thousands of soldiers there to die, right? The Russians are sending a few specialists. This is exactly what the United States would do in a similar situation, right? They are taking a minimal risk and hoping that the local population bears the brunt. And that's exactly what's happening. So as this friend of mine said, we in the United States, no matter what we want in the long term, ought to be very careful about supporting a situation where we fight Putin to the last Ukrainian, right? We could end up truly destroying this country that at the moment is in crisis but is not yet destroyed. So if it's true, that militarily speaking, no matter what kind of weapons they have, they are just unbelievably outgunned and overwhelmed by this force that's backed by Moscow. What, in fact, can we do that's helpful? I actually think there are a lot of things we can do, and it starts with money. Um, what we've done so far is we've offered a $1 billion loan guarantee. So that sounds like a lot of money, but actually it's not. When, when the Office of Management and Budget calculates the cost of a loan guarantee, that's like co-signing a loan, it comes out to a few hundred thousand dollars. So that's what the American taxpayer has offered the Ukrainian people so far, right? That's nothing. And we're talking here about sending them $3 billion worth of weapons. My question is, I'd love to know of all the senators and representatives who have said, you know, I support sending guns, yes, absolutely. How many of them are prepared to send $3 billion of actual loans? How about $30 billion of loans? $30 billion, just for the record, is less than 1 40th of 1% of the collective GDP of the United States and the European Union. And the reason that I think that's very worthwhile is that, first of all, Ukraine's an enormous country, right? We are not talking about a tiny little nothing that won't matter. If Ukraine collapses, and I mean financially, I mean socially, right, humanitarian terms, if Ukraine collapses, it's not going to end in Ukraine. This is going to be a European disaster. And I think we noticed over the last two or three years of the European financial crisis, European disasters pretty quickly become American disasters. So I think it would make a lot of sense. Again, I'm talking about loans, right? Whatever you guys thought about the bailout of Wall Street or the auto industry, in retrospect, at least in terms of stopping a crisis, they proved to be relatively effective. A lot of the funds were paid back. So the idea that we might be able to loan the Ukrainians out of their crisis is a lot more appealing to me right now than the idea that we send weapons. Let me just say this, too, about weapons. Um, if the United States fulfills the threat to send weapons, then we don't have any more good options. At that point, everything rides on whether the Ukrainians win with those weapons. And if you believe, as many experts I talk to do, that they can't win anyway, your, your sort of cynical interpretation, then we've lost before we've begun. What I would do at this point is with the threat of sending weapons already out there in the air, I would press the Russians to accept a negotiated outcome where they can keep some of what they've taken, but that we draw a line and we say, this point and no further, or beyond that, there will be the following consequences. As long as there's a threat hanging out there, it's actually a more effective bargaining position than if we actually follow through on that threat now and are proven to have no effect. I hope that answers the question. It does. You're as cynical as I am, I think. Okay. 
Well, I'm from Washington. Hello. Thank you. I have relatives about 100 miles away from the Ukrainian border in uh, eastern Slovakia. Um, it's a little country, but like a lot of other people in, uh, in Poland and elsewhere that share a border with, um, with the Ukraine, playing out the scenario that you just spoke with in, the last, uh, in your last answer, what's Eastern European look like in the, in the short and the near based upon whatever scenario plays out? Yeah, so the, the, the nightmare scenario that's been, been kind of spun up and then kind of uh, deflated and then spun up again is that, you know, this is just the opening act, right? That, that what's next is a, an invasion of the Baltic states and an invasion of Poland, an invasion of Slovakia, and so on. Um, first of all, there is a difference between invading a former Soviet state like Georgia or Ukraine that has been flirting with the West right, that sort of on and off again with the EU, on and off again with NATO, and an out-and-out out NATO member country, and in particular one where you now have significant number of American boots on the ground. And that's actually the case, for example, in the Baltic states. I think Putin understands that. But more importantly, I think uh, the signaling of almost everything that the Russians have done in the Southeast, as, as utterly distasteful as it is, right, as completely in violation of international law as it is, has nonetheless not been that this is the beginning of a blitzkrieg to take Kiev and then Warsaw and so on. It has been, we have limited objectives here, mostly political. The goal being to undermine this new Ukrainian state. Remember, and I talked about Putin's domestic reasons for that and so on. Now, does that mean that given the right circumstances, he won't go further? Of course not, right? It's entirely possible, as some people suggest, that Putin will try to take a swath of territory that will connect up with Crimea. It's only another two or 300 kilometers. There's no question that if the Russian army actually went into Ukraine en masse, they could do that. But one interesting detail, and this came out in the last week when the atmosphere, the kind of weapons frenzy, if you will, in Washington was at its absolute height, and Senator McCain was clamoring you know, to send guns and so on, um, the top U.S. general and the top U.S. diplomat at NATO uh, revealed the information that you know, credible NATO, as in you know, operating spy satellites, were showing that there were only at most about two or 300 regular Russian troops in southeastern Ukraine. And as I said earlier, there's a good reason for that, right? If we were intervening in a third country, we would try to do as little as possible. Now, that's the situation today. Mission creep, as we know, happens quickly and without necessarily intending it. So again, is it possible that in the next year, 18 months, if we let this conflict continue, that more and more Russian forces would pour into, into Ukraine? Yes, it's very, very possible. Even that, though, is still a far cry from a Russian invasion of Kiev, of Poland, and so on. But I understand very well the perspective uh, that, that Eastern European countries have. The last thing I'll say on this, and, and I, I had a conversation with the former Polish foreign minister about this, in which um, I called him cynical, by the way, so in retort to your <laughs> earlier question. Uh, you know, he said, well, why don't we just amputate these undesirable parts of Ukraine? And then Ukraine can have a permanent pro-European majority, and, you know, it can basically be like a second Poland. And I said, well, that's great for Poland. That's horrible for Ukraine. Not only in the loss of territory, but in the notion that a new Ukraine is going to somehow be born in the abandonment of 25% of its citizens. Unfortunately, th there is a tendency now in a part of the Ukrainian government towards exactly that. But you know, my prediction would be that to take that kind of decision would probably be the beginning of the end of the success story of this revolution, and it would just lead into another, another cycle of post-Soviet cynicism, and there'll be another revolution in 10 years, and Ukraine will continue to be a basket case. I hope that doesn't happen. But all this is reason why, if there is a negotiated outcome that's possible, even if it means accepting some degree of autonomy for these separatist regions which have been forced on Ukraine and so on, uh, that is far preferable to letting the cancer of this conflict continue. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start out Go American University Eagles. All right. <laughs> I saw that up on there. Um, you talked about the corruption in Ukraine and how rampant that is. Yeah. And then you're talking about giving an un, a, quite a large sum of money yeah. as a loan to Ukraine. In the short term, Aren't you financing a very, very corrupt regime or government yes. 
And in the short term, how does y Ukraine remove itself from that corruption before Putin makes his next move? His short term and removal of corruption short term are very different in time frame. And then the last thing you have is the, I guess the, the elephant in the room, as I'm gonna call it, and I am from Washington, I have been there, and that's the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And that has a huge dynamic yeah. in what plays out now. Okay, uh, well the short answer to the first question about corruption is yes, yes, uh, a lot will get stolen. A lot's getting stolen right now, and a lot will get stolen in the future. Um, but this is something where we have experience. So if you look at most of the new European Union member countries, which were heavily subsidized by the old European Union member countries when they were brought in, right? Uh, so, so Poland's doing a lot better today, um, but that's because they got an influx of about $80 billion of assistance, you know, largely from Germany, right? Why? Because it was in Germany's huge strategic interest to bring Poland into the EU and stabilize and so on. Did a lot of that money get stolen? Yeah, of course it did, right? So this was a short-term sacrifice in the interests of a long-term societal shift. But the only thing that's going to change Ukraine is actually a, a psychological change on the level of the ordinary Ukrainian person. And I like to analogize it this way. You know, when, when, uh, when uh, Pavlo, you know, the ordinary Ukrainian guy, uh, is, is on his way home from work in his car, uh, ready to go home and complain to his wife about how the tax official came in and bullied him and stole money from him and the health inspector is, is demanding bribes and some you know, powerful guy connected to the government is trying to steal his business. On the way home, he gets stopped by a cop and the cop issues him a citation. And instead of accepting the citation with its endless bureaucratic language about how he has to appear in court and so on, he just slips a 50 grievney note to the cop and he drives on home. That scenario is emblematic of how Ukraine works today, which is on an intellectual level, ordinary Ukrainians hate corruption. On a practical day-to-day -day level, ordinary Ukrainians practice corruption, right? So breaking out of that cycle is very, very hard, but it's not going to happen if the atmosphere that they live in is this atmosphere of post-Soviet chaos and crisis. So then to your question about timeline, right? How do you walk and chew gum at the same time? How do you end a war at the same time that you're reforming an economy and combating corruption? The answer is you can't. That's why you have to end the war first. It is a fantasy to think that the Ukrainians can just kind of go naively on their way, rebuilding a new society while there are artillery bombarding their country, right? That, that isn't going to happen. But is that an argument for focusing on military conflict to end the conflict, or is that an argument for focusing on negotiation and compromise? And I think the problem, I tried to describe this earlier, this sort of back against the wall, rock in a hard place political problem, is that Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, as problematic as his background may be, he's actually our best hope. He knows that he needs to accept a compromised, negotiated solution. But he's up against a parliament that doesn't accept that. And what I worry is that the United States is going to decide to send weapons, you know, however many weapons, $3 billion of weapons, $5 of weapons, but that those weapons are going to arrive invariably too little because there's no amount of weapons that's going to totally turn the tide of this war. But more importantly, too late. You're talking about timing. If those weapons come in April or May or June, Right? After this round of fighting has settled down, you enter the muddy season where you can't move a tank or anything else in that part of the world, uh, and there's an opportunity to negotiate. But at that moment, weapons arrive in Kiev, what's the president going to say? Oh, what, we should just sit on these weapons. No, of course, the parliament is going to demand that they be used and that there be a new offensive to regain lost Ukrainian territory, and we're going to be right back into a new cycle of war, except this time the narrative on the Russian side is we're being attacked by American weapons. Uh, 2016 election, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, you know, the uh, Ashton Carter, the Secretary of Defense nominee, was sort of, you know, boxed in. He had no choice but to say, yes, I would incline to send Ukraine weapons. Uh, you know, no Secretary of Defense wants to commit to sending weapons to a country that we have not sent weapons to before in a confirmation hearing, but that's the nature of our politics, right? Uh, some of the people who've signed on to this uh, declaration are considered uh, a declaration in support of weapons, are considered uh, putative uh, candidates for SecDef and other high offices uh, if, if uh, Clinton uh, were to be the president. Um, so people are staking out positions now, you know, two years in advance of a new administration. It's, it's absurd, right? We're in crazy town. Um, because God knows, I, you know, the situation two years from now is going to be completely different anyway. Was that cynical enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, I wanted to ask a couple of these text questions. Um, several have, have emailed asking if you can consider this Russian-Ukrainian war as beginning of a third world war, mm -hmm. and um, what do you predict as Putin's end game? Where, do you, where does he plan to halt his advances? Right, yeah, so that sort of speaks to what I was saying before. Like I said, the signaling at this point Look, I, I completely understand. I have lived a long time in Ukraine, and I have many dear friends in Ukraine. I get where they're coming from. I understand why it is tempting to portray this conflict to the West in particular and to the wider world as the beginning of World War III. I totally get it. It's not, and that's not just naive optimism, right? Uh, as, a, as a friend uh, and colleague of mine pointed out in a, in a public event just last week in Washington, in response to just exactly this kind of entirely understandable alarmism, he said, let's not forget that at the end of the day, this is a conflict that's being fought by a rump of the former Soviet Union, a Russia which is less than half of its size, which has you know, far less than a third of its military forces, right in its immediate neighborhood. Right? At the end of the day, the United States is an order of magnitude more powerful than Russia, and the NATO alliance is yet another order of magnitude more powerful. Right? The notion that, that Russia is on its way to picking some kind of wider global fight in which it intends to stand alone against the might of NATO is completely insane. And I don't think Putin is that crazy. On the other hand, wars are never intended consequences. No one ever goes into a war saying, well, I think we should escalate a little bit more. And I think we should escalate a little bit more and a little bit more. No, these things happen because you're committed to the outcome. And is Putin absolutely committed to the outcome? You bet he's committed. He does not want Ukraine to be a success, which is why if there's a window of opportunity for even a short-term ceasefire, you take it, because then unpredictable things can begin to happen, and that cycle of escalation can be broken. So my argument, again, is now is the time. Say, look, the separatists have taken the airport. Fine. They've taken the railroad junction. Fine. Now is not the time for a massive nationalist American armed campaign to retake a couple hundred kilometers. Now is the time to say, yeah, fine, we accept your peace deal, and we're going to focus on the things we really need to do, which is reforming the Ukrainian economy and actually bringing Ukraine into Europe while it's still possible. I think the notion that provoking Putin somehow you know, puts the Russians on the line and he will be revealed to be a paper tiger and he's so weak is courting disaster. Putin is the kind of guy who would certainly much sooner move nuclear weapons closer to Europe and provoke a real crisis with the United States than he would simply, you know, peer over the edge and say, ooh, that's too scary, and give in, right? Because that's the end of his power in Russia. Okay, this is going to be our last question. Oh, where'd he go? There he is. <laughs> Given that um, war is an extension of diplomacy, wouldn't it be that um, one of the goals is to get Putin into a quagmire, into a condition where uh, right now is using legionnaires or special forces, uh, volunteers, quote unquote. But their history with Afghanistan is that the population really didn't like all the body bags coming home. To give enough weapons to uh, the uh, Ukrainians and the fact whether or not that's going to be effective because the staff general is being trained by the Russians in the first place. But, wouldn't that pr provide an opportunity for the West to get um, the, the Russians involved in something that would eventually be uh, Putin's downfall because of a prolonged engagement? A and one other thing also that the, the, um, uh, what is it, the uh, Italians, the Greeks, uh, I think the Spanish also don't want sanctions because it's hurting their economy and the uh, Germans selling tanks to the Poles, all of that stuff coming into play there. Right, so, so um, great question. Uh, my answer is this, if, uh, if you propose the Afghanistan model, sure, uh, Afghanistan worked out really badly for the Soviet Union and great for the United States, and horrifically for the Afghans. The problem with that type of scenario in Ukraine, again, is we will fight Putin to the last Ukrainian. It will destroy Ukraine. And I'm amazed at the support for that type of idea, that we can just sort of bring the chaos, that we can send home the body bags. It assumes that the costs that will then be borne by Ukraine will not be infinitely worse 
than they are, as deplorable as they are right now, but still manageable. And that's what I worry about, because at the end of the day, I actually care about Ukraine. I really care that Ukraine survives this conflict and that it comes out stronger and prosperous. And let me just, if I can, just, just pick a small bone with this, this body bag idea, because a lot of my colleagues are peddling this, and it's absolute garbage. Number one, senior U.S. intelligence officials have said that the number of actual acknowledged Russian soldiers in Ukraine is not high enough that we can get that body bag count or that body count that we imagine. That's just a, a logical problem with the scenario. What we'll end up doing is just killing Ukrainians on both sides. Number two, how many is enough? We imagine that there's some abstract amount of damage, economic damage, human damage, reputational damage that Putin just can't handle. That, I think, is a fantasy. Because as soon as the United States, in particular, intervenes in this conflict, Putin can accept any amount of damage and the Russian people will back him up. If you want to know what that number is, think about World War II. Try 25 million. And we don't want to do that kind of math. It ends in disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.